Good morning, folks. Welcome to the Easy Power Tuesday Refresher Series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm an applications engineer here at Easy Power. Today, uh, we're in the third part of a four installment set of webinars that are focused on the introduction to protective device coordination. Today, we're going to be introducing the use of low voltage power circuit breakers and molded case circuit breakers. And then we're going to actually be doing some coordination along the way, which we've been sh uh, sh short on or light on the last two weeks. We've covered fuses and the importance of uh, time current characteristic curves. And now uh, today we're going to be put all that in practice. I would like to emphasize this is not a, uh, a design webinar. This is not how to design systems. This is not even an in-depth analysis of the National Electric Code. What it is, is a focus on the capabilities of the Easy Power tools to help you answer those questions in analyzing your design and in verifying compliance with the uh, NEC regulations. So with that caveat, uh, welcome to all. First of all, we'd like to start with a poll question. If you would please participate. No obligation, um, no right or wrong answer, just trying to get some feedback. So which do you prefer for motor protection? And uh, let's leave this open for about 15 seconds, get everyone seated and a chance to respond. We do appreciate your attendance. This session will probably run long today and all attendees will get receive an attendance certificate. So glad to have you here. All right, looks like we're close to a quorum. Let's go ahead and close this out. Here's how folks have weighed in on this. Uh, pretty uh, wide de distribution between uh, motor control circuits, motor circuit protection, and molded case circuit breakers, which I guess I would have anticipated. All right, and then the second question is how often are you successful at coordinating molded case circuit breakers? And this one's a little, little trickier. And again, there's no right or wrong answer and no obligation, just trying to get some opinion feedback, because this is where we'll be spending most of our time uh, during the next hour. All right, looks like we're all the quorum there. Um, pretty interesting results, even split with between people that are kind of good at it and apparently not not so good at it or not having that much luck. So thank you for participating. Let's jump into the agenda. So what we're gonna, we'll be talking about a little bit on series rating, not to confuse rating and coordination, but it is important as far as evaluating the uh, capabilities of your components in your one line. Then we'll, we'll be uh, getting into detail on coordinating with molded case circuit breakers, low voltage power circuit breakers, and how important the TCC plots are for that. Then uh, at the tail end, we'll be talking a little bit about the new guidance from the National Electrical Code regarding arc flash energy reduction in certain applications, and then showing how useful the TCC plots are in evaluating the results from that uh, those regulations. Now, again, not to be confusing coordination with, with series rating, it is basically important that all the equipment in your one line or in your system can withstand the worst case fault at any particular bus. And so the way that's normally uh, handled is that we have, well, from a manufacturer's data sheet, a rating on a particular device and its capability to operate within a band or a range of fault current. And so in an application like this, where we have all the devices rated for a 65,000 amp rating, and we have the worst case current on this particular bus to be 31,400 amps, then all are compliant or all are fully rated for that fault. And we would infer or relate to this as a series, a fully rated situation. 
Now, on the other hand, if we have, and, and this is basically what Easy Power would expect to see when we uh, analyze what's called equipment duty. Now, on the other hand, there's a potential for what's called a series rating. And this is due to the fact that manufacturers test pairs of particular devices such that a given type and rating of the upstream device will allow, if you will, looser rating on the downstream devices. So in this particular case, on the feeder breakers, we have all 10,000 amp rated devices, but the potential for a 31,000 amp fault, and we have that corrected or countered by the fact that the main breaker is rated for 65,000 amps, and according to the manufacturer's data sheet, will give us an increased rating on these downstream breakers, and this is due to testing that's that the manufacturer has done. So in Easy Power, this can actually be dis displayed or shown uh, in the following way. So I'm going to open up a one-line diagram where we have a series rating situation. So in this case, the downstream breaker is rated for 10,000 amps. The upstream rate breaker is rated for 100,000. If we go into short circuit focus, again, I'm looking at bus four and bus five, and we fault these, just these bus, this downstream bus, we see that we have a 14,000 amp potential fault current uh, downstream. And if we invoke the Easy Power Equipment Duty check, we see that this particular breaker is overdutied because of the positive number by, four, by a 40 some odd percent. Now, for those of you that don't know, this direction or this flag is due to the fact that in our short circuit options, I have set a threshold under short circuit options for equipment duty to be a negative 10% of the rating. So if any device is within 10% of the top of its rating curve, then we want to uh, see a flag. And that's not only is this exceeded the 10%, but it's over duty by 40%. Well, this is all taken care of by the way we've set the one line diagram up. So if we come in and look at the way this particular breaker has been parameterized, we see that this is all accurate. It's a square D panel QOB, and we have it a 30 amp uh, selection. When we go to short circuit, we want to make sure it's in the device library. And to do that, we want to see this value change when I hit calculate. Sure enough, it's rated for 10,000 amps, but this is based upon the ins instantaneous rating that's on the data sheet. If we want to take advantage of the series rating, again, that's due to the manufacturer having done the testing with certain devices, we can have the check by opting for series rating. And when we calculate, we get 100,000 amps as a rated, but this is based upon the upstream device, which we have an I-line HG. And if that breaker is changed, according to the manufacturer, then this 100,000 amp rating is not necessarily valid. So based upon this, now we can go back and with the 100,000 amp rating, go to short circuit, fault this bus, look at equipment duty, and we see that now it's no longer a problem for this particular bus. With that said, there's some caveats that go along with it. And specifically, when we have a situation such as this, where we have motor contribution, uh, the fault on this particular feeder is going to see current not only through the main breaker, but also contribution current for, from these other motors, and in which case its exposure will be more than just that limited by the upstream breaker. So specifically in this case, series rating cannot be used. So that's just word to the warning and it's all about equipment duty okay let's get back to coordination 
again, a different topic, a different subject altogether, but they're tied hand in hand. If we're not uh, properly rated, then coordination's out the window anyway. So coordination basically says for a remote fault, we want to have the protected device closest to the faulting uh, element to trip first before any other device upstream uh, can clear the fault. And in the case of molded case circuit breakers, we have two active mechanisms to uh, be sensitive to the overcurrent. First of all is a thermal element, which is a bimetallic strip that at a, seven, a given current will bend enough such that the connection is interrupted. And then a magnetic trip, which acts as an instantaneous fault protection. Now UL requires certain requirements for thermal, the thermal element. It must be able to carry 100% of the rated current continuously at 40 degrees in open air and 200% of the rated current at the trip times that are given on the breaker size. And so this is part of the UL listing. Now the thermal element, as I mentioned, is due to this bimetallic strip. And as this heat heats up, the two elements expand at a different rate and causes an open when the current gets high enough to produce that amount of heat. The thermal, the electromagnetic element is a coil in series with the current and at a certain level it will actuate and interrupt the rating. Um, and so these work in conjunction in a molded case circuit breaker. According to a UL listing, the molded case circuit breaker must have an instantaneous trip. And due to this, because all molded case circuit breakers have an instantaneous trip, this causes the potential for miscoordination of molded case circuit breakers. A special case of molded case circuit breakers is the motor circuit protector. Basically, there's no thermal element. It's magnetic only. And so we only have an instantaneous uh, device. Inst it's, excuse me, instantaneous trip. And the advantage there is it, uh, it has the ability to be able to be coordinated with certain devices upstream. But in the, as in the case of all other motor protection, it can only be used in combination with the motor starter or an overload relay. Uh, consequently, it can't be used as a feeder breaker. And in easy power, is treated as a thermal magnetic type of trip unit. Now, special applications allows a wider uh, range of sizes and trip elements in the standard. And they're specifically designed with trip coils on some transient suppression. So as the technology has become more advanced, solid state trip units have been uh, are available in molded case circuit breakers and they are digital and allow a molded case circuit breaker to operate very much like a low voltage power circuit breaker, including ground protection. Um, but it's still required to meet the UL listings for molded case circuit breakers. And so typically what you'll see is with the solid state trip unit, the TCC curve will look very much like a low voltage power circuit breaker with these, uh, both the time delay and the current delay, the current setting being adjustable, uh, but you're still required to have an instantaneous trip. So the typical applications uh, would be metering functions and communications. Molded case circuit breakers maintenance and testing can be difficult because they're not really designed to be serviceable uh, and that's due to the fact that supports that is opening the case potentially voids a warranty. Although in my background, I know we did service, we, we were a government facility and we had procedures where we did service and test the multi case circuit breakers. So thermography has proven to get a way to get the assessment of breaker condition, potentially if you have, uh, Corrosion built up on the contacts it will provide a heat signature that will show up on a, a FLIR image. UL type testing requires two fault interruptions at the breaker max. IEEE 1458 covers life expectancy 
and it's not free to be able to have field testing to, to determine life expectancy. And as with all other calculations in IEEE 1584, arc flash calculations assume all breakers will function within the published TCC. You know, that's an important point that we overlook. We don't emphasize that often. And that is all the calculations and all the TCC curves are not worth a hill of beans if the equipment hasn't been uh, maintained per manufacturer's instructions or even exercised. And so uh, the probability that a, a device will trip per the data sheet uh, becomes much less if it hasn't been opened in some amount of time or it hasn't been operated in sometimes decades. So again, molded case circuit breakers have a single short circuit rated stated in RMS symmetrical amps using the half cycle network. Breaker testing is done as specific power factor and that's why uh, we calculate X over R at every bus in the system and then derate whatever the manufacturer data sheets uh, stipulates. And this is done automatically by a feature we call smart duty and easy power. And so <laughs> this little chart is something that is valuable because in my head, I can't equate power factor to equivalent X over R. So they've done it for us. 100% rated motor case circuit breakers are standard for 100% current in an enclosure that generally limited to 80% of continuous current and continuous is defined as three hours. And this is the basis for the NEC load calcs using 125% of continuous load, which gives us the 80% factor. Now, coordination between molded case circuit breakers, I don't want to say is virtually impossible, but in general, they don't coordinate. And that is because they all have, are required to have an instantaneous strip device. But based upon the fault current that any particular feeder or load may have or exhibit, there is the potential for a particular coordination up to a certain point. So for instance, if we look at the TCC curves for these two devices, a fault in this area to the left of the overlap, we are guaranteed coordination because the magenta breaker will trip first and the turquoise uh, breaker will trip second. The problem comes or exists when we have an overlap and we're in an area of uncertainty that uh, we don't know that the turquoise breaker will not trip when the current's in this area. Now, molded case circuit breaker manufacturers are testing for series coordination, and that's where a, a guaranteed coordination based upon the testing having been done uh, can allow certain certain circuits or certain combinations to, to uh, validate the, co the coordination. And two ways to kind of do this is the upstream breaker with the high short circuit withstand rating set to instantaneous above the actual maximum current, and then using molded case circuit breakers that are tested in combination. So we'll try to show some uh, examples of that here in a second. So as I mentioned, coordination of molded case circuit breakers pretty much is valid only by test. And the test data shows that they will coordinate even though the curves overlap on the TCC plots. Now one downside to this is it's pretty much manufacturers don't test other equipment. And so it's limited to the use of breakers from the same manufacturer. And when it's reported by the manufacturer, it's tracked in the EasyPower device library, which I'm going to touch on uh, as we get into the tools. So basic coordination starts with an evaluation of the TC3 curves for the load itself. And so by plotting the load damage curve and then the next two levels of protection in the one line, we can see the comparison between the expected fault current and the interrupt rating or interrupt setting for the upstream devices. 
So let's start with the motor circuit protector. Okay, and I've got, so those of you that aren't familiar with Easy Power, when I go back to, when we go into uh, coordination, which is this little icon in the top center, we have the ability to store TCC plots that we previously set up. And so I'm going to just recall them. This is a motor circuit protector on switch gear four. So as we described, the motor circuit protector has just one trip, and that's the instantaneous or magnetic trip, and there's no thermal protection. And so by plotting the, the chair shape is the starting curve for our 100 horsepower motor here on the left. And as you recall, we're displaying the asymmetric tail, the locked rotor current at this level, the acceleration time being looks like about four or five seconds. And then the full load current is plotted on the upper end of the, of the motor. So the selection of the uh, motor circuit protection is based upon the locked rotor current that the motor will see or the circuit will see when we first apply across the voltage, across the line voltage. Now you might say, well, this short stubby line is a thermal damage curve. How do you get protection there? Well, if you recall, that's the restriction on MCPs is that you need to have a thermal overload or a starter circuit contactor. And so in Easy Power, that's the image. This is the graphics display showing that there's an overload contactor included in the circuit. If I go to the setup for this particular breaker, under specification, we're showing down here, you can't hardly see it, but the breaker contactor is part of the graphical display. And what that's due to is the fact that we're including a motor overload that's um, displayed if we plot the TCC curve for the relay, and then we set up what the manufacturer recommends and by displaying the inclusion of that contactor, now we do have motor protection through the overload section of the curve. So one, it's important to have that included. And two, you need to refer to manufacturer's data sheet to properly pair the overload protection and the MCP. Now, none of this really affects, um, well, I shouldn't say none of it, the overload protection is not going to affect the arc flash calculations because the fault current that we're talking about for arc flash is going to be the worst case, which is going to be out here. So we're seeing motor circuit protection clipped at an asymmetric 12,513 amps, which is the result of, of this upstream fault. And that would be the uh, the, cur the current that's used for instant energy. So just, just as an aside, so we know the breakers, the tripping device for a fault at this bus or this connection, if we right click on the, the uh, TCC plot, and insert the arcing tick mark, this little triangle shows us that 100% arcing current is the most conservative and where it intersects that upper right-hand boundary, that's going to be the integration time used for calculating instant energy. Any questions about MCPs and thermal overload protection? Okay. Next, um, I want to emphasize both the, in, the ability to include an MCP in motor, as motor protection as part of a uh, motor control center. And so in this circuit, we have a motor control center fed by a low voltage power circuit breaker. It should look something like this in our easy power. So I'm going to close this. And by all means, if you've got a question, feel free to jump in there and interrupt. It's not going to hurt my feelings at all. So again, we're feeding a motor control center. Inside the motor control center, there's a large motor, which is looks like it's 
150 horsepower, and it's the largest single load. We've set up the motor control center to select a motor with a TCC. And so that's how we're plotting the curve. And here's, here's the motor circuit protector that's used in that circuit. Looks like it's color hammer. So it gives us this plot. Now, obviously, we've got an overload protector included. And it looks like it may or may not give us protection through the thermal damage curve. But now we want to coordinate that with this upstream feeder. And so BL4 is being displayed as this turquoise plot. Now this, this as it's shown, is uh, miscoordinated. If we fault this particular bus, then we have clipping, as we can see here. And so certainly, the um, motor circuit protector will trip long before the low voltage power circuit breaker. But we still have miscoordination that we need to deal with. If we hover over the plot for BL4, we can see that we can move the setup for BL4 to a current setting higher than it was before. So it's set to 3200 amps at this point with a pickup of five. And then if we want to have better coordination, we can pull the, the uh, short term down to a lower current. Now this, because when we plot this bus, we're plotting, we are faulting the main bus in the motor control center. And when we're calculating instant energy, the main breaker more than likely, if it's even there, it looks like it may be a bolt, a, a main lug, the incident energy is controlled by this upstream breaker. So if we right click and insert an arcing tick mark, again, there's our 100% arcing current and where it intersects the magenta breaker uphand upper plot, that's the integration time. And we can tell by looking down here on the bottom of the screen where the cursor is placed. So the integration time looks like it's about 1.8 or point 187 milliseconds. The instant energy is controlled by the setting of BL4. That's as low as it can go. If I move it higher, Yeah, that's as low as it can go, 6.9 calories. So at this inter at this rate, uh, we have a motor control, uh, motor circuit protection. It's utilizing a, now on this one, I didn't show, why didn't I show the, uh, show, so I'm, I'm plotting the overload curve but when I set up the breaker itself, I didn't include the contract contactor. So that was, that'd be a mistake that I'd want to correct. This is only a, a graphical display, but it better represents what the correct, what the uh, correct circuit should reflect. Okay. So now we have coordination uh, with a low voltage power circuit breaker and a motor circuit protector. And it looked pretty spiffy, except I should, of uh, a contactor indicated on my one line. Okay, now we want to coordinate with uh, two low voltage power circuit breakers. Again, we want to make sure we have coordination and rating equivalents. So let's go back to the pre existing plots. And again, in coordination, I have TCCs that I've already created and stored. If I go to TCC options and on my one line, I synchronize the colors. I show a turquoise breaker as downstream and the magenta breaker is upstream. And so for a fault on this bus, we definitely have miscoordination. Um, and just like before, uh, I want my motor to be protected 
by BL3. I want it to be clear of the asymmetric tail on the motor start, and I want it to be within the motor damage curve, which is a short stubby line. Then for coordination on the upstream breaker, I want to move this out. I want it to be clear of the transformer damage curves. Now there's, this is, this is a little bit more different. The um, instant energy on this particular bus will be due to BL3 set points. And so if I right click, insert the arcing tick mark, that's going to be the integration time do for instant energy. And so the setting on this upstream breaker will not have an effect as long as I let, uh, I keep the coordination. Um, and so it may have, the actual setting may depend upon what other loads uh, are in my system. And that's why the recommendation is to coordinate on the largest downstream load, because if you're coordinated for that system, you'll be coordinated for smaller loads that are also in that motor control center. Now, just as a note, we're talking a secondary protection. So the protection for the transformer is, I'm not concerned about the inrush because these breakers will not see the, the inrush current. Uh, there may be, if I, depending upon what I have for upstream protection, there may be a requirement for protecting the transformer with this downstream breaker. And the, the guidance is basically to clear this curve. And I think uh, the maximum rating is, well, I'd have to check the NEC charts. I think it's 125%, but that looks pretty good. If we look at our instant energy, This, yeah, this, this will be, it's going to be a little over, uh, just under four calories on the motor itself. Okay, so that's coordinating. And obviously, this is the easiest task as far as co coordinating two devices that have uh, adjustments on both dimensions. Okay, so that leaves us to coordinating uh, fuses and overload contactors. Again, it's real similar to uh, to the motor circuit protector as far as as far as the inclusion of the co uh, overload contactor. But let's go find it. So frequently, especially in uh, medium voltage applications, you'll have fuse starters or fuse fuse disconnects and include the starter or motor, motor overload protection. So again, we have the fuse plot based upon the data sheet for the, the fuse manufacturer. And this is a the, the dicey point is that right now we can only protect the motor uh, as, as it stands. We really don't know what the fault current is and at the downstream extremity. If we open up the um, fused disconnect, the fuse switch icon, we have the ability to include a motor overload. And now as we apply this, you see it properly properly sized per the manufacturer's guidance. You can have thermal protection of the motor itself. Chuck's wanting to know if you have multiple downstream breakers and you coordinate the upstream with the largest downstream load, how do you handle the miscoordination? Um, you know, I don't have it. That's a good question. I don't have an example of that drawn up. Actually, the next one may be close. But if you coordinate with the largest downstream load, 
you should be able you should be able to coordinate or the smaller loads will be within that profile so i i guess i'd have to have a specific example before we could show that let me see how this looks so in this case i've got an example where we've got two panels a 480 volt panel and a 208 volt panel and we've got breakers in both and we're protecting uh, the downstream loads now panels are a little different in that i can have a motor load but i won't necessarily have the plot when we fault the uh, pan downstream panel we're faulting the main bus itself so let's go find that See if I can answer Chuck's question with this one. Okay, so here's the downstream bus. Yeah, this this comes close to answering the question. So what we're looking at is uh, panel one, row seven panel one main and we're not really showing any panels on panel two in other words we're just plotting the main bus for this fault current and what we're showing is if we're coordinating the main panel one breaker with the feeder breaker coming out of the panel then anything else will be coordinated and the, what we're trying to show is this point and this this is where you have to go either to the manufacturer's guidance and and use another tool besides the TCC All right so panel one row seven we see tripping at 38 80 and then in which case the row seven breaker trips first and because of this overlap, the main breaker doesn't trip until you get up here to 10 seconds. Now, how does that, how does the manufacturer guarantee that that's going to coordinate? Well, another way to do this, let me kind of show you the other aspect. Let's not save this. We're talking TX4 this puppy right here if I'm in coordination looking at current fault this bus there's the current it gives me my sequence of events and now if I look under PDC options and say show me a sequence of events report fault the bus again It shows that we get the uh, panel row seven tripping first, and again, a long delay before the main is tripped. And then the fuse is a little bit less on the main, on the upstream. Um, but that, that shows that the two breakers are guaranteed coordination up to a certain point. And that's, if you will, a piecemeal coordination that's observed on the plot. So to answer your question, Chuck, uh, it, it's maybe a two-step approach. You may have to do a sequence of events to verify there's a delay and then plot the TCC curve and ensure that your fault current is down below this particular overlap. It could still be up here, and it's up to you to either verify the uh, in fact, let's see if I can do that. And the way I would verify it is to ch change the current. Yeah, so it, it looks like it's coordinated at 5,900 amps. If I go back and decrease the amount of impedance here, which may or may not be possible, the, the amount of impedance in the cable itself I can vary the current that's going to be flowing for my fault. So 
again, it's it's a difficult task to guarantee coordination, and you have to rely on primarily the manufacturer telling you up to what current it will coordinate. Okay, that was that was unimpressive, but it's it's kind of the way you need to go. Okay. Now, as we kind of illustrated, uh, buses protected by multi-case circuit breakers uh, are very good as far as that's very good protection for arc flash, but you should have, or you may have poor coordination. And, and again, this all guarantees that the, it's based on the guarantee that the equipment will operate to manufacture spec. Um, basically, they, they are certified to two different levels. Old case circuit breakers and insulated case are listed under UL 489. Low voltage power circuit breakers under UL 1066. So in general, as far as easy power is concerned, old case circuit breakers are used in switchboards and low voltage power circuit breakers, which are dry out, are more in switch gear. Uh, low voltage power circuit breakers are field maintainable they're a little bit heavy duty component wise and through fault rating is uh, not instantaneous guaranteed, but it can be purchased with an instantaneous trip. And so as we can see, we have an adjustment at multiple places on the curve and these are all specified in the setup of the breaker itself. And so, as far as doing a study, you'd want to make sure you record all these dial settings accurately and make sure that um, we already did this example. Okay, so this brings us to the inclusion now of uh, arc flash mitigation in the National Electrical Code. The uh, National Electrical Code has specific requirements for coordination in emergency and critical operation applications. In the most recent uh, electric, on the most recent NEC, there's a just a explanation about coordination show, showing that if we are under the emergency source, energy source, then you need to have series coordination all the way up to the generator. Um, and so, D must coordinate with C, C must coordinate with F, F must coordinate with E. However, if we go back and look at under normal operations, they've stipulated that D must coordinate with C, C must coordinate with B, and C must coordinate with A, but there's not a requirement for A and B to be coordinated. Uh, this is a little bit more esoteric than <laughs> I can explain other than uh, there's a potential for having A and B uh, to be set at the same delay and still be uh, still qualify or be approved under NEC requirements. Now, along with the latest explanation of that issue is an Article 240.87 which requires arc energy reduction where the highest continuous current setting or the device with the ability to uh, can be adjusted above 1200 amps or higher has to meet requirements of 24087A and B. 247, 240.87A regards documentation and make it available to anyone that has design requirements, installation operations, or inspection available, and then provide the uh, method chosen will reduce clearing time to be set below the available arcing current. The gotcha here is that they don't tell us what energy to set it to or what time to set it to, just that it's available. And then they give us a list of available clearing time reduction methodologies. And again, what I want to show here is how useful the TCC plots are for showing these systems. So let's run through the list. Um, let's close this guy. So 
So let's start with maintenance mode, although they don't stipulate it per se. Maintenance mode is a temporary setting that allows us to change to a preset reduced trip point or trip time for any downstream bus. For instance, if we short all the buses and fault the current and look at instant energy, with normal settings, we have a 5 calorie exposure, 10 calorie, 22 calorie, and 20.4 calorie. And if we invoke maintenance mode, on the whole system, we can do work with 3.6 calorie, 3.1 calorie, 3.8, and 10 calorie. Now, the way this works, now, I wouldn't necessarily change all of these at one time. They're individually set, but they're controlled by a switch on the front panel or by uh, the electric control signal wired into the back. And the, again, this is um, a lot more obvious if we look to see how it actually works on the TCC curves. So let's set up these. Let's just do these two breakers down here. Plot the TCC curves. Now, normally, if we have a fault downstream and look at instant energy, we see a 10 calorie exposure, and BL1 is the tripping device. And that's our turquoise breaker. If we right click on the arcing current, you can see indeed, now again, I have overlap at higher currents. I have non um, series coordination issues at higher currents, but at my arcing current, I have very clear coordination between BL1 and BL. Three, whatever, whatever VL1 is. Now, the, the point to be made is if I set maintenance mode on for this breaker, then that same that same fault current didn't change that much. Let's set it on for this breaker. And again, that's that's the other point is that no one which breaker has the most influence over the, the safety of the uh, the bus. So again, at this point, if the upstream device will trip. And at that current, it will clear, give us less than four calorie. So the reason, I, obviously, that's why I never use these two breakers for the demonstration. If I use these breakers over here, I think it's a little more clearer. So if we take maintenance mode off, fault this bus, set maintenance mode on. You can see the tripping time on this breaker is much cleaner, and consequently, I get instant energy reduction by just setting this uh, one breaker on by itself. Now, the, the downside to maintenance mode is that you lose the potential for series coordination in your system. And if we look at this, maintenance mode is a feature that's built into the breaker itself, it's something that's been available for better part of 15 years but on the phase trip settings it has and these this is a GE breaker what's called a reduced energy let through and this is this is invoked or set on when we flip the switch or we set the control signal to on and that means a pickup can be set much lower than it is in normal operations so that's where we get the maintenance mode protection um, so maintenance mode is good. We lose coordination. It has to be included in the uh, work permit. And the disadvantage is if you fail to disengage it 
after you complete the work, you risk uh, inopportune shutdowns uh, due to that higher sensitivity. All right, let's look at zone selective interlocking. This is similar in that uh, each of these breakers has the ability to trip faster, but the difference is they have communications between the breakers in each stream. So this breaker talks to this breaker, which is the indication shown on the, the graphics here. And what it amounts to is if this bus here faults, all three breakers will sense the current but this breaker says, no, you guys wait until I get a chance to trip before you operate. So it sends a restraining order out to these other breakers. And if they, if it fails to, uh, to clear the arc, if it fails to respond, then the upstream breakers have a chance to do their thing. So again, let's look at how this works. And it's easier to see this on a coordination plot, on a uh, time current characteristic plot. So if we go to coordination, plot the curves, and these again are set up according to the manufacturer's recommendations in current and fault current. But if this downstream bus faults, and we've got maintenance mode, or excuse me, zone selective interlocking on, this first breaker will, will respond. So if this bus trips, this breaker responds, and we still have coordination between uh, the rest of the system. If this fault, if this bus faults such that BL4 doesn't see it, doesn't see the current, then the next breaker up will fault, will trip. And uh, likewise, if the fault happens such that the two downstream breakers haven't responded, then the uppermost breaker will respond to the fault. And Robert's saying it sounds like zone selective is best uh, for hospital emergency systems. The answer is more than likely yes. Uh, there's a, a, a lot that goes in favor of zone selective interlocking, not the least of which you can leave it on all the time and still get uh, selective coordination and you don't have to worry about somebody turning it off. It's, um, I'm sure there, I don't know a thing about the pricing, but I'm sure there's some uh, exchange for uh, having that capability and the communications link between all the systems. I was gonna show what that looks like. If we go in and look at this, the setup for a breaker, so this one has both maintenance and zone selective interlocking. Zone selective interlocking has its own tab. And all I really need to do is to show the upstream breakers that are associated with this particular setup. And again, the, the set points are all based upon manufacturer's re recommendation for the load current and the fault current that the system will see. Okay, so yeah, it's a very attractive opportunity if you have a choice. Maintenance mode uh, may be uh, easier to implement because you don't need the communication link. Okay, then the next one. Now, the gold standard for transformer protection and for um, arc flash protection, arc flash sensing, is in effect differential relaying. And what this does is give us the ability to compare incoming current without flow from a given zone. So in this case, we're protecting both the transformer and the main bus. We could just as easily put these CTs down at a lower part of the system. Um, and there's trade-offs involved in that. But that gives us the ability to protect a, a bigger zone or more individual protection for the feeders. The bottom line is, this can detect a small differential in current, but that's something we cannot simulate in easy power. So the way this is set up is if we open up the uh, bus 
that's being protected, the dialog box, and we go into the Arc Flash tab, we can set up for user defined time, in this case R1 set up for a differential function, and we use the response time, including the breaker opening time, uh, that's dictated by the manufacturer. So the response time of the relay, any communication link, and then in this case, we're operating uh, probably FS1. And so its delay time or its opening time would be part of this quoted delay. But by doing that, now we can go back to short circuit, fault this bus, and we see on our range for arc flash that the tripping device is R1 on differential function, and the delay time is what we set it manually um, in the uh, in the bus setup. And so it's handled this way because we can't um, we can't simulate the low the, the low current detection that the differential relay can provide or monitor. Now, very similar to this and and uh, equally as impressive is the ability to to do that same function with arc sensitive relays and so in this case instead of having a, a differential transformer we have uh, fiber optics links to different buses where we can set up and and monitor arc flash on switch gear downstream or downstream equipment and all this is communicated through the fiber optics link to the relay and then the relay responds by opening the main breaker in this case so the delay time for any individual bus would include the response time of the fiber optic system the relay sensitivity and then the opening time for the the breaker and so as we set it up, let's say we look at the dialog box under Arc Flash, we'd have user defined time for Arc Flash sensitivity and the response time, and there'd be one for each of these buses. So if we look at this, we can set this, we're calling it Arc Sense there, but the same, same as our effect. Now, on a real system, we could actually also have a combination of high triply calc or rather TCC trip times auto calculated in addition to the differential. But now when it comes down to it, if we have a fault on this bus, we can see that it's an arc flash response. The trip time is 52 milliseconds we get a very low instant energy. Likewise, this bus could be protected. It would have the same type of indication. So uh, some very sophisticated, um, and frankly, the cost is, uh, th there are trade-offs involved. So there's an installation cost, especially for retrofit, it's less in uh, a new design. The downside is if you have a fault, there's gonna be some damage to the system so some things may need to be um, replaced, but the trade-off and the added benefit is you have much less damage to start with. So it depends on how important uh, that function is to your particular system. And so all these are, are left to uh, option the choice of the facility if they have any system that has currents or adjustable devices that have greater than 12,000, uh, 1,200 amps of uh, protection. Holly's asking, in terms of bus protection arc flash study, how about breaker failure coordination with the bus? Um, so in this case, this is light sensitivity. So if the breaker fails, it may or may not generate an arc. And so this is all based upon that, whereas the differential relay doesn't care about the arc as much as it cares about the current. So it depends upon what your situation is 
which of these alternatives makes the most sense. I think that was, let's see if we had any more. Now, any of these could be um, provided, could be accommodated as far as the NEC requirements. And it's important to document the choices made to make sure you have performance testing available and presentable if somebody wants to uh, check on it. Let's see if I've got any more examples. Yeah, that's it. One other, one other uh, choice as far as clearing time. Well, the point to be made too is an instantaneous trip setting, a temporary adjustment of that instantaneous trip setting is not achieved or not permitted. In essence, that's what maintenance mode is. It's just not something that's done manually as far as the adjustment. So there's kind of a specific separation between capability and implementation. Um, and then the, any approved means, the one thing I left out was a uh, an active energy reducing active. So number four, that reply, uh, What's regarded as an energy reducing active arc flash mitigation system is referred to as a arc quenching or earthing system, which once an arc is detected, will fault or provide a hard fault on the main bus, causing the main fuses to open. And because the system is designed to protect itself against a hard fault, it solves it solved the need to have any downstream protective device. Uh, and it's impressive how quickly it works and how it reduces the energy. The, the trade-offs involved, you need to replace the fuses and kind of reset the system, but it's effective. Depends upon how much the alternatives uh, would cost as far as the worst case situation. Okay, so we've covered system coordination with multi case circuit breakers. Verify that it's difficult to coordinate in all cases. Uh, low voltage power circuit breakers should use instantaneous settings to prevent mis should not use instantaneous settings. Uh, we'll cover this next week when we talk about transformer protection, but essentially only the, the last protective device before the load should have the instantaneous uh, trip capabilities that the currents we're talking about. Proper data entry will ensure equipment TCCs will be accurate. And then we've discussed the arc energy reduction methods. Interesting point here is that the NEC describes what methods are available and to make sure that they're adjustable below 1200 amps, but they don't get into any more detail about what to do with it or how it should be used. And so it becomes a discussion primarily between the the consulting firm and the company policy makers as far as how that implementation should be implementation should be done interesting discussion uh, thank you all for attending i uh, hopefully you got something out of this next week we'll be covering relays and transformer protection uh, be sure to check the website for regional training and uh, an RFlash workshop coming up. Have a good day.